the sort of stock phrase that I hear all the time, which is that someday all humanists will be digital humanists in 20 years. It doesn't really matter what we do now. And this is a sort of cliche that's true in some minimal sense. Uh, the rules for scholarly debate, argument, and evidence are obviously changing where they're going to happen, how open they're going to be. But one of the things that I find so interesting about big data, and I'm glad that you all chose this as the topic for your DH conference, is that thinking of data analysis as a problem of humanistic interpretation actually unsettles that idea that we're all becoming comfortably more digital day by day. Um, the fact is that not all of our resources are digital, not all of our resources are going to be available for analysis through big data, and not all of our questions are questions that can be reduced to computer code, or can be even approximating computer code. But equally importantly, some of them are. So I actually hope that there will be recognizably digital humanists in 20 years, and recognizably non-digital humanists in 20 years, because if everything is equally digital, that means that some fields are going to miss out on some of the biggest opportunities that they have today, or else that lots of scholars and administrators are wasting a lot of time on algorithms and websites that they don't necessarily need to be making. So another way of thinking about the question that big data poses to the digital humanities is that it's sort of an intervention. What sort of research questions are all of this computation and all of this data going to let us answer. Because from the standpoint of most mainstream historians and literature scholars, digital methods haven't yet shown their efficacy in a really substantial way. Jeff Rockwell talked in his keynote yesterday about how so much of textual analysis in the 1980s and 1990s was about the question of authorship attribution. And those are questions that are algorithmically easy but are really, really important contributions to the scholar of the literature and didn't end up changing the field substantially because of that. And I think with all of this hype over big data, we're at some risk of replicating that same mistake once again. So I think it's worth asking what it is that we don't expect data to be able to do for the humanities. And one person who has a very strong vision of this, I think, is Stanley Fish, who published a somewhat vitriolic article, a set of blog posts in the New York Times uh, last winter criticizing the humanities for failing to take into account what he called the only true form of textual criticism, performing criticism that narrows meaning to the significances designated by an author in favor of an elevation of play in the digital humanities. Now, you can quibble with this on the margins. There's some very interesting cases where we can look at individual authors in their context to try to much better understand the significances that they were intending. But for the most part, I think Fish is actually right about the limitations of digital research. The benefits of digital reading are just not that great when working with the number of documents that we tend to use in a typical humanities project today, tens to hundreds of books. But there's also an obvious answer in Fish's criticism to what we can contribute. It's far from clear to me, particularly as a historian, that real live humanistic questions should be entirely about the significances intended by an author. In fact, one of the biggest benefits of using big data is that we can get past those questions and start to exhume patterns of cultural change that are completely individual when we're only studying or completely invisible when we're only studying individuals. And these are the sorts of questions that all this massive data we have coming online right now can answer beautifully. But it requires a very different sort of reading, one in which we have to shackle ourselves to the sorts of questions that computers are asked and lower our expectations in some ways, and in others dramatically increase our ideas about how large the structures we can describe are. Handling that trade-off is actually quite hard. Now, I'm talking about this in the future tense, but in fact, big data applied to humanistic questions is already here, and not just in the digital humanities. It's here in the sciences, where we see all of these scientists now coming to textual research. I'm at the Cultural Observatory at Harvard. This is the logo that the scientists chose for themselves, which I think is designed to sort of frighten all humanists into believing that suddenly books are going to be put into the microscope have electrolytes put on them and presumably destroyed in this chamber which they can't get out of afterwards. But actually there's a lot that humanists can learn from the ways that scientists are reading books. And in most important ways it's not really deeply threatening to 
us because the sort of stochastic patterns of change that scientists are asking are often not really ones that are relevant to our questions. If anybody should be scared of social scientists, it's not us. Um, at the same time, it's also here in the traditional humanities. The far and away most important application of big data to humanistic research are scholarly search engines that have been around for 30 years. And humanists use these all the time. They use them in ways that dramatically shape scholarship. In my own field of American intellectual history, you can see that early career monographs 20, 30, 40 years ago tended to be intensive studies of individual scholars trying to rehabilitate their reputations. Today, they are not. Today, they tend to be these big picture conceptual histories of race or public opinion in the United States. And if you talk to the people who write these studies, they're very explicit that they wouldn't have been able to do this without JSTOR, without Google Books, without the ability to just plug these search keywords into engines and read enormous quantities of texts instantaneously. But there are problems with the ways that humanists are doing this. Actually, just plugging into a search engine doesn't give you a very good sense of the scale of the archives that we're looking at. So I think that as we move towards a more sort of responsible and humanistic inclusion of big data into our research practices, I think we need to think about these data sets and the results that we can get out of them through statistical analysis as just another source for traditional humanistic interpretation. Um, and as humanists do with any source, the question is what we can answer with it and what we can't. Each source can be exploited for its own ends. And the place that I think the strongest benefits in humanistic interpretation for these massive data sets <coughs> is in the study of super individual categories, just like I was talking about with Stanley Fish. There are all of these categories that have been noted in all of these data sets that are things like academic disciplines, ethnicities, genres, author genders that allow us to see social structures at work in ways that we weren't necessarily able to before. But to fully realize the benefits that digitization offers him is we need to develop new strategies, new infrastructures, and new vocabularies for reading these digital collections from the top down. In some ways, this creates a really high bar for humanists to meet. It means that we have to understand the data in a fundamental way. Keyword search is not enough. We need to be able to look at all of these evidence statistically, and that means that rather than letting computer scientists design the algorithms that choose what text we're going to read, we're going to need to be more invested in reading them ourselves and in designing those algorithms ourselves. <coughs> Historians do not let translators go to archives, find the documents that are useful for them, and then bring them into English and work on that. But in some ways, that's what we've been doing with search engines as we try to use these digital databases today. But on the other hand, it actually makes it a lot easier because it takes away some of the problems that we tend to get hung up on when we talk about big data. Um, I'm always asked, and I think most people who work with these huge texts are always asked two questions in particular about whether the corpuses that we're looking at are representative and what the problem that messy OCR does, optical character recognition, does to our research. But in fact, this is just another sort of source and that these are issues that don't cripple the ability to work with data to begin with. That's a sort of very scientistic way of thinking that you need to have a statistically representative thing. In fact, humanists have always been able to read against the biases in data once they understand them, or against the biases in their sources. We shouldn't expect a digital historian to work with perfect OCR or with probabilistically representative text any more than we would expect a diplomatic historian to be working with sources that always tell exactly the truth about what was happening in the place that they were at all times. So having promised probably too much, let me talk about what this will actually mean in practice in research with the stuff that I work with, which is millions of books, millions of newspaper pages. So as I said, I've been working at the Harvard Cultural Observatory with these scientists whose um, most uh, widespread creation before I got there was this thing, the Google Ngram, <coughs> which allows you to track the changes in the uses of vocabulary over time. So this is the word railroad, for example, in 
efficiency that once the railroad had invented, usage of railroad goes up um, as other forms of transportation come in, as railroads get less interesting, it drops down. Now, there are two big problems with this for humanists. I'd like to see patterns in all library books, but that's an incredibly divergent set that really makes sense to consider as a single unified whole. The patterns of library acquisition are changing all of the time, and very few of us have any sense of what's actually in our libraries, although that's something that we should be starting to figure out as we use search engines. And second, because of copyright restriction, it's very difficult to get any sense of what the individual books are behind here. You can search inside the Google Books database, but that's actually a completely different set. So the patterns that you see in this data are not the patterns that you see in uh, the Google Books main corpus. So a lot of what I've been working with there is trying to develop an infrastructure for looking at books at a similar scale to the Ngram viewer, but <coughs> allowing you to arbitrarily build up your own corpora based on limits that you choose and having a transparent interface where you can immediately get back to the text to understand what's driving the patterns that we see in the data. So this initially came out as a project called Bookworm, which we released through the uh, Digital Public Library of America last year. Um, and it lets you create your own categories so you can see uh, a word like natural selection occurs at different rates in the sciences and the social sciences in the rest of the corpus. You can see, you know, social Darwinism peaks in the 1890s as opposed to a different period. <coughs> Citations of natural selection in the scientific literature. And we've been, oh, and it includes these connections to the text, so you can actually go and read the books behind these points. And we've been releasing a number of other frameworks based on the same infrastructure. So one works with the archive, which is about 700,000 physics articles, primarily from the last 15 years. Um, and others work on things like JSTOR or the Chronicling America set of historic newspapers from the Library of Congress. Um, and although they allow these sort of timeline visualizations, what's important is that once you structure this stuff in a useful way for data interpretation, you don't actually have to create timeline views. Um, it has an API behind it that lets you structure across any of the metadata categories that are possible. So here, um, sort of a toy example, but this is in newspaper pages. You can see whether uh, newspapers published in various different cities use fishing, which is red here, or farming, which is green, more. Um, and that lets you get at geographical patterns, at temporal patterns, and at the interactions between those things. So in real <coughs> questions, the Engram's approach doesn't always work, partly because uh, you can't necessarily see patterns. My dissertation research is on the history of the concept of attention. And Engram's will sort of give you this view that attention is essentially a sort of constant phrase in the history of books that we've always used the same amount, and that matches some of the prejudices which you push against when you're trying to write a history of a rather abstract concept, as intellectual historians tend to today, is that it seems that it may not have a history at all. But even using the Engrams database, it's actually possible to untangle this somewhat. So here, for example, what I've done is taken in the Engrams database the words that immediately precede attention in uh, the four million or so books in Google Ngrams. And you can see that there are really substantial patterns of change in the ways that the word is used, if not in the rate at which it's used. So, for example, there's no single most common word used before attention, but there is this shift between the early 18th century, the early, sorry, the early 19th century, the early 20th century, and today where pay is the most common way of talking about attention. We'll talk about paying attention. It falls enormously out of favor around 1900, and then it rises back up again. At the same time, call becomes the predominant way it's used before about 33% of all verbs using the word attention. And once you start to break down this sort of data by 
generic categories, you can see how this kind of evidence lets us localize these sorts of shifts, understand that these are real shifts which are happening and which don't seem to be tied necessarily to any forms of authorial intent, but which are acting on a cultural state. So we can look at publication country to see where a new phrase like focus attention that emerges in 1890 happens. And there's some evidence that it's a slightly American phenomenon. We can look at gender, which it doesn't seem to be substantially tied to in any way. And we can look at things like discipline, where there's an incredibly strong effect. Uh, these are Library of Congress classifications, and there are these two bands here. BF is psychology, LB is pedagogy. And this is a really interesting way to think about where these changes are happening, because it's obvious that the new languages of attention are going to be coming out of psychology to some degree. And this is how historians have tended to write about it, because Historians like to write about individual intellectual figures, and they like, in America in particular, to write always about William James and John Dewey whenever they get the chance. But when we try to localize these changes in individual archives, we do end up focusing on the fields like psychology, where there are these enormously influential individual figures, rather than in the fields like pedagogy, which seem to drive the change equally strongly, but in a way that is not necessarily centered around individual figures. Um, if you look at focus attention, it's actually much stronger in the, but this one is concentrated attention, sort of two very similar metaphors. Focus attention is even stronger in pedagogy than it is in the, uh, in the psychological literature. And when you go through and read lots of these text that you can unearth this way, structured by the genres that they're in, you can actually see that there are some differences in the ways that focusing or concentrating attention is being talked about. Um, so that's these generic issues. I've also gotten really interested in the ways that we can look at geographical patterns. I just want to run quickly through something that's much more speculative that I've just been working on lately, but that I find really uh, really fascinating, and that's the idea of places mentioned in newspapers. Now, historians know that newspapers are a very important force in national identity formation. This is the work that Benedict Anderson has done, obviously, uh, sort of spawned 20 years of newspaper studies in the idea of regional uh, formations of identities. And one of the things that we can do with this enormous store of data that the Library of Congress has made available about newspapers is actually to see what are the places that newspapers are talking about. Uh, so since we're in Kansas here, the states that are talked about in Kansas newspapers, there's nothing enormously surprising here, except uh, possibly that Nebraska is substantially less represented than I would have thought, which is actually sort of historiographically significant if you want to think about you know, the populist movement in the 1890s, there's lots of debate about the degree to which it's a Midwestern movement and the degree to which it's a Southern movement, that Kansas is citing uh, sort of Southern states more than it's being involved in discussing the, the other Great Plains states in the Midwest. Uh, it's important on that front. What are you talking about here? Um, good question. Uh, this is from 1870 to 1922. All digital history ends in 1922 as a copyright restriction. <laughs> uh, and we can take this same sort of data and actually do it for all the states that are out there. Um, it's not necessarily particularly useful. You can also normalize it to get a much stronger sort of statistical sense of where places are talking about more than other places are. It turns out just nobody's talking about Nebraska, and Kansas does talk about Nebraska more than almost anybody else does. Um, but there are also problems with this sort of analysis, because you, know, you can see Missouri and Arkansas are heavily talked about, but you know, there's a Missouri River and there's an Arkansas River, with both of which go through Kansas, which is going to tend to bump up the numbers on this sort of analysis. Nonetheless, there's a really strong mathematical relationship here. Um, 10 minutes for, okay, okay, um, that's fine. Um, so there's 
the farther away a state is, basically, the less the people talk about it. Um, and this is a pattern that we can do not just by looking at the states that Kansans talk about, but we can do this across all the various states that show up. And it, tends, it turns out to be this sort of log linear relationship between distance and space. Now, this is sort of interesting from this kind of cultural point of view of trying to come up with mathematical models of the way that human culture works, but it doesn't do anything substantial for answering questions because it doesn't tie back into these genre issues. But what we can also do is look at things like artificial social constructions like regions. So if we look at census regions, uh, the South, the Midwest, the West, it actually turns out that even if you're the same distance away, 500 miles away, say, you will talk about states in your own region substantially more than you will talk about states in other regions. And even we use a completely different data set, which are cities. I took a list of 600 cities, which are relatively unambiguously named. Uh, every city that had more than 5,000 people in it, and it doesn't share its name with another city of more than 5,000. So Lawrence isn't in here because there's Lawrence in uh, Massachusetts, but you can get very good geographical coverage by doing this. We can look at all the different newspapers that we have, and these same patterns still hold. You find enormous elevation within your own state over your region. You find elevation within your region over your over the baseline for the country. And I suspect, although I haven't gotten the chance to do this yet, that you will also find another level of elevation within the country over cities and other countries that are relatively farther away. I've sort of you know, experimentally looked at some Canadian cities, and that seems to be the case. Um, so what I would suggest is this let, helps us look at these sort of Benedict Andersonian points about distance and relative formation of cultures. And once we start to read that against the genres that we have, we can ask some really interesting questions. Um, for example, we can take out the African-American newspapers from the sample and compare them to the white newspapers from the sample. And it turns out that that regional elevation, the formation of these regional communities, exists in the white newspapers, but it doesn't seem to exist in the black newspapers. And there are a lot of possible explanations for this. And I'm going to have to, at some point, actually go through and read a lot more of the newspaper articles than I have. But it can be about, you know, advertising and commercial networks, it can be about relative political coverage, but it certainly helps us to understand something about the process of community formation to know that there are substantial differences in the sort of imagined geographical worlds that white and African-American newspaper readers are coming up with. Um, so those are sort of my conclusions there, but I, I do want to get questions, so I'll break off at this point. that's not as true in the late 19th century as it is okay. today. Um, it's the, the New York Tribune is the big New York newspaper. And I don't believe that the New York Tribune has you know, printing presses in Boston the way that the New York Times has printing presses in Boston nowadays. But also one of the, one of the big advantages of looking at large data sources like this is that to some degree these things are all going to wash themselves out in the end unless there's something real going on. If all the New York newspapers are focused on a more national scale than all of the Chicago newspapers say, you can say that you should throw out the New York newspapers because they're more national, but also to some degree it's a fact that the people who are reading newspapers in New York City are getting a very different view of the United States than the people who are reading newspapers in Chicago. that 
help interesting and novel some of the conclusions you can come to from the science? Well, so partly I think that it's going to be a long process before statistical. We need to build up our ability to really know these sources before the conclusions that we can draw out of them are accepted on their own merits. I think one of the reasons we've been in this holding pattern for the last five years or whatever, where we're still, to a large degree, reproducing findings that have already been done, is that if you come up with a relatively new finding that's entirely based on the big data approaches, you're not necessarily going to get anybody to agree with it. So I think one of the reasons that so many people are trying to integrate this in with other forms of analysis is not just because you know we tend to be methodologically pluralistic in the humanities to begin with, but also because I think we need to get some greater level of comfort with the results that come in here before we end up um, trusting them entirely on their own. And that's right, we shouldn't necessarily trust these results entirely on their own now. But on the other hand, although the sorts of arguments that we can make out of this stuff may sound like traditional sorts of arguments, that's sort of just a general fact of any um, any, any, any human story. We're, we're, we're always arguing over the same points over and over again. And the fact that we now have a new sorts of evidence which can help us both argue over those points with you know, another view and another source of evidence that lets us talk about stuff in a new way. And also that lets us um, reach out to new people who weren't necessarily persuaded by the ways that we were trying to convince them of things before, but that actually now when you can show undergraduates or journalists or whoever else a uh, graph that tends to be much more publicly engaging is an important goal of the humanities to actually convince other people and not just ourselves of the findings that we're coming up with. That's a very good point. I probably don't um, go around asking traditional humanists what they're doing. <laughs> I think probably what could really be new is to question your findings and realize that when you say people in New York are reading newspapers and getting a regional view, what people are you talking about? Because you said you're, you're, you're already uh, dealing with an abstraction. And I think probably if the humanists in this world have made any contribution worth talking about, it is attention to our humanity, not to our abstractness. So I don't necessarily agree with that, actually. And I think this is an important debate that needs to happen inside the humanities rather than happening in a field where proponents of a sort of individual agency are the humanists and the people who are willing to talk about the force that structures that act on people we don't necessarily understand are scientists or social scientists, because there is a very strong tradition in critical theory going back for decades where humanists do talk about the ways that various identity groups, that classes, that um, ethnicities are shaped by the experiences that, are, that they're exposed to. So I think you're right, it's talking about what people in New York as a whole read is not particularly useful, but being able to talk about how different ethnicity newspapers are exposing the, um, the different groups that we know were largely, or I don't, actually I, I don't know newspaper history that well, so I shouldn't go out that far on a limb on this, but um, the ways that different ethnicities are reading uh, different sorts of texts is very important. Um, one of the other things that you can do with these newspapers is look at party affiliations. You can look at Republican and Democratic newspapers in the late 19th and the early 20th century and being able to see how the different political structures were shaping the worldviews of the people who are reading those newspapers is very valuable and that touches on humanistic questions, it's not um, just social science. Uh, uh, I'm a graduate student in special education, 
yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, I really have to change these slides at some point because um, you have to spend enormous amounts of time in libraries to memorize all of the <laughs> Library of Congress classification codes, and even though I spent, yeah. <laughs> um, So essentially, I mean, the Library of Congress genre classification classification system is, sorry, Brad, do I need to show No, no, I was just gonna ask if Lev Manovich was in the room, and, or if anyone has seen that. Um, and if not, then we have, uh, we have a We can go on for a while. <laughs> People can just sort of wander out. Um, so, so one of the things that we have to be careful about when we're using these sorts of structures, they have to actually be useful ones. And the Library of Congress classification system is a highly problematic one because it's a very arbitrary uh, hierarchy of knowledge. Fortunately, for my purposes, it's a hierarchy of knowledge created by Americans in the 1910s and the 1920s to classify the ways that they saw the academic landscape existing in that period in time. So, while using it on 1980s, 1990s documents, or 1600s, 1700s documents is problematic, it's actually quite good to use for uh, intellectual history at the turn of the century. So what these are basically shelf locations in the 10 or 20 university libraries that have made it into the Internet Archives texts online. So LB is one of the two or three education classifications. Um, I can never remember the difference between LA and LB. I think LB is more applied pedagogy, and LA is theory and practice of education, or something like that. Um, and then BF up at the top is psychology. And then, uh, I know I can quiz myself up here, but the other ones that you see it coming in relatively quickly are PE and PN, which are uh, various national literatures, uh, studies of literature places, and then uh, down in the uh, QA, these are the sciences and medicine, and to start talking about focusing on attention relatively earlier than other fields, social sciences, and at some point, slightly later, too. And so one of the things that I think we need to start uh, demanding of our search engines is they let us look across all of the categories in the library in this way, rather than just presenting us with one list and a sort of faceted set of search results at the side. Um, are the, um, <coughs> excuse me, are the books in this chart all in English? Because there's an uneven distribution of languages across this passage. Right, so the books are not only in English, but at one point I ran a machine classification across uh, all of these to find the books that were filed as being in English but weren't actually, find the books that were definitely in English but weren't filed as English, because librarians almost never say that a book is in English when it's in English. They say it's in German when it's in German, or French when it's in French. It seems like two-thirds, three-quarters of the time they don't note that an English book is in English, which pervades a lot of these large sources. Um, and then also all of the texts which have really terrible OCR have been excluded, that same algorithm catches those because they don't look like English to a computer even though the words on the page are. Can we talk a little bit more about your work with keywords in context, for example, as you, you showed the, the prefacing word, for example, but, you know, thinking of, you may not know this, but it's really not the Arkansas River that runs through Kansas, it's the Arkansas. Oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm disappointed. I'd like to hear more about it. <laughs> how you're using the, the phraseology around the word. Yeah. Um, well, so this is actually a problem that really touches on whether we are going to be creating our own research infrastructure or whether other people are going to do it. Because the way that Google Ngrams was put out, the idea was that it was Ngrams. And so pay attention is a two gram, attention is a one gram, pay attention to is a three gram. And it wasn't set to allow us to ask sort of more intensive questions about the relationships between words and ideas. And it's actually, from a standpoint of data structure, it's very hard to set up uh, data that allows you to do something 
like this. Uh, the, as we move into more sort of online infrastructures of big data, we've been moving away from sort of traditional relational database stores to what are called NoSQL key value stores, where it's much harder to ask complicated questions of individual items, and it's just assumed that there's one entity and we're going to be pulling out everything that has to do with that one thing. So what I think we should be doing more of, and what, this was actually the chart that brought me into the digital humanities to begin with, trying to get this thing set up, is thinking about how we can look through contexts around words or contexts around keywords that we're interested in and pull out sort of web of interrelations around here. So to make this one, I think what I did, or I don't know what I did, I went through and I first pulled out all of the words that appear immediately before attention after setting up the database that was indexed in a way that makes it possible to do that. Um, and then I spent a while looking at that list. It turned out that it makes a lot of sense to do a form of stemming on all of the words. So draw here is draws, drawing, drew. Um, and then I just went through by hand, actually, the top 500 and pulled out all of the things that tend to be verbs, uh, which is another thing that I think humanists can actually do quite a bit more. There's this sort of assumption that everything needs to be automatic, that we need to move over into natural language processing.